Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a minute and address some of the questions and comments you left on the first water heater video, because there are some really good and insightful things there. But real quick, I just finished the rocket stove heater video, and this thing is freaking crazy. It blew my mind. My wife's busy editing the video, and I'm crunching the data, and we're gonna get that video out as soon as we can. But for now, here we go on the questions and comments. Also, there were so many that I haven't had time to read or respond to a lot of them. If you had a real question and I missed it, I'll try to answer it if I can, so try asking it again, or you could always ask it over on Patreon. So first off, this heat exchanger design would not be a good design for a regular use long-term heat exchanger. I'll get into the reasons in a second, but the purpose of this design was just to test direct contact with the flame and the copper. I wanted to try to extract as much heat as I could and transfer it to the water. I just wanted to get some data on the high-end values of what I could expect from direct contact with flue gases and a copper coil. There were a bunch of comments on counterflow and thermosiphon, and I'll address them together because in my application, they're very linked. So counterflow is when you introduce the cold water at the top and it circles down the coil to the bottom. So the water is sort of preheating as it circles down to the hottest point of the stove right before it exits. And it's true, this is a lot more efficient and you'll definitely get more heat to the water. So a ton of you really know your stuff and you're paying enough attention to realize I didn't do that and point it out. And next, a thermosiphon is when you heat the water, it naturally wants to rise to the coil all by itself. And so you can actually run it without a pump and the water will just circulate. The reason I didn't do a counterflow system is because I eventually want to convert this to a thermosiphon system and take the pump out so that it could be fully off grid. But I also didn't know what to expect for temperatures. If it got too hot, I could start creating flash steam events and even like sputtering boiling water. By putting a pump in the system, I could actually accelerate the flow of water. In case things got too hot, I could be introducing cooler water from the barrel and cool things down. As I get more data on temperatures and things, I'll be able to trust the system a bit more and then remove the pump and hopefully rely on just a thermosiphon. All right, a bunch of people also mentioned water jacket systems, and they're really cool, but they're just not right for what I'm trying to do with this project. But I'll take you outside real quick to my outdoor off-grid shower, which is a water jacket system, and I'll give you a quick tour of that. It's just a basic firebox down here, and the flue actually splits into three pipes that run up through the water tank and then join back up into a single flue here at the top. So there's a fair bit of surface area touching the actual water inside the tank. And it takes about an hour to heat up quite hot, and then you get about 20 minutes of shower temperature waters. And then on a sunny day, by the late afternoon, it's quite warm by itself because it's painted black. And if you don't mix it with cold water, it's really warm enough, but you'd probably only get about 10 minutes of shower time with that. Or you can do a short fire and just boost it all the way up. It's plumbed in here to a spring, so this is the supply. There's also a pressure relief valve and a drain pipe installed too. And then the supply for the shower comes out here at the top and goes into the shower stall. The wood store is just right here, right next to the wood stove. There's a bench here and a sort of little changing area. There's a place to hang towels and clothes and a little wall to protect any of those from getting splattered by the shower. The water just drains right through the floor and it's collected and piped away. It's just a very standard shower with a mixing tap, an adjustable head, and then it's also vented on both sides so that the steam can just flow right through. And there's a beautiful view while you're showering and at night you can even just watch the stars. And you might have seen the shower in the background in the first water heater video. There were also a bunch of comments on galvanic corrosion, which is another great point. Galvanic corrosion is when two dissimilar metals are touching each other and there's actually a chemical reaction. So in this case, it would be the copper coil touching the steel standoffs and there would definitely be a reaction and in a long-term unit, this would have to be addressed. But just a word on how this occurs. In this case, copper is more noble than steel, meaning it's less reactive. Steel is more reactive than copper, which means that the steel would be acting as the anode and the copper would be acting as the cathode. And when they're in contact, the steel would actually be losing electrons to the copper. So the majority of the corrosion is actually gonna occur on the steel, not the copper. As the steel corrodes and rusts, the rust is actually gonna create a slight insulative barrier between the steel and the copper, and it's gonna slow down the reaction. Don't get me wrong, the copper would react, and over a really long period of time, the copper would corrode and would fail eventually, but the actual real problem in this situation would be on the steel standoffs. Another common comment was about the different expansion rates between the steel and the copper as the heat is introduced. And this is another great comment. They'd be expanding at different rates and it would cause friction between the steel and copper. And it is another point of failure and should be addressed in a final design. 
The buildup of creosote is another great comment that a bunch of people left. And this is again, really true. That copper coil is just a magnet for creosote. And in my mind, it's one of the bigger downsides of this design. I could easily make the insulation jacket have a hinged door. So it was really easy to just open it up and have access to the copper coil. But even if you could just open a door and pull the copper coil out, it'd still be kind of a pain to clean and a potential safety hazard. So in my mind, in all but an occasional use outdoor application, it really isn't the way to go. Another one was bending the copper pipe with ice. A lot of people seem to prefer sand, which is actually a method I do use for bending small pieces of copper, like these coils for an induction heater. The thing is, personally, I think filling 50 feet of copper line with water is gonna be a lot easier than filling 50 feet of line with sand. And one little update since I first filmed this video, because I had a really great comment exchange with one of the viewers, and it totally changed my mind about this. Another problem with the sand is getting it out. With such a big coil, it'd be really hard to get all of the sand out of this. And he suggested using salt, which I was skeptical about at first because of potential corrosion. But the salt won't really react too much with the copper. And the best part is that you can just run water through the copper coil and it will just dissolve the salt away. You don't have to try to get the sand out of the copper. You just need to make sure it's a really fine grain of salt so it's as densely packed in as it can be and there's as little air as possible to help avoid it kinking. It's a really brilliant idea and I just wanted to share it. I still think for a big coil like this, I'm just gonna use water. All you have to do is make sure there are no bubbles and it freezes and bends really easily. But the salt idea is actually pretty intriguing too. The next one's one of my favorites and it's just pointing out that a lot of the gases are just going straight up the center of the copper coil. They're not touching anything and they're just leaving no heat exchanged at all. So it's just wasted energy. In my original design, I plan to drop a piece of pipe that's capped off at both ends, just in the center, so that it would take up a lot of that space so that the air would just have to flow around it. But some people suggested doing things like putting a spiral, like a DNA helix or an auger bit down so that it would sort of swirl the gases all around. I really like that idea, it's super fun. I've actually been coming up with an entirely different design, which I'll be getting to in the next couple of videos, so I might not get around to actually testing something down the center, but I did want to mention it because it could be really significant and it's just a cool idea. All right, so that's it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for all your comments and your questions. Keep asking, keep commenting, and I'll do my best to respond. Hope you have a great week and see you soon.